Um, I think it's on your tent to start. Okay. Now it hits me. Oh dear. Mm. Ooh. I'll just to say hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of The Partial Historians. I am one of your hosts, Dr. G, and sitting beside me, looking incredible as always. Oh, thank you. It's Dr. Red. I'm spurious furious today. Mm, yeah. I'm a feminist witch, apparently. Yeah, this is according to our <laughs> jumpers for those listening to the audio-only version of the Mm -hmm. yes. And we are deep in the history of Rome from the founding of the city. We really are. And we're well into what is the early republic at this point, I would say. We are. So I'd like to do a bit of a recap, if I may, Dr. G, of what Please. happened last time. I mean, I don't know if it's possible to recap all the things that we went through last episode, but I'm going to give it a shot. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> so, we were dealing with the character Spurius Malius, an upstart equestrian, or so the sources would have us believe. A man who makes the grain rain down on Rome. <laughs> That's right. He, he's not like, he's more like, <laughs> imagine small little grains falling from the sky. <laughs> Ow, my face. Oh, but I am hungry. Aim for my mouth. <laughs> Yeah, so Spurius Malius had come along during this time where Rome seems to be experiencing a grain shortage. And it's not the only time in the early Republic that Rome would go through this problem. I mean, we've talked before about the fact that this century, particularly this middle part that we're in right now, does seem to be a particularly tough time for Rome. And that's not just going by the little hints we get in the sources like this one, talking about a bad famine, <laughs> but also the archaeology, which we've mentioned before. Yeah, there seems to be less building projects, there's just sort of less growth and expansion all around, and it seems like it's not just Rome, it seems to be most of the Latin region, at the very least, if not greater Italy as well. Yeah, which would explain why they were struggling to get some grain from their neighbouring <laughs> Everyone's like, I need to hold on to my supplies, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Cannot share. I, I can't spare a square. <laughs> yeah, so we had this issue and Spurius Malius had taken it upon himself to use his private fortune to try and restore the balance, to bring grain back to Rome. But this didn't go down well with everybody, did it, Dr. G? It did not. No. It went badly enough that things got out of hand. Yeah. And violence ensued. Indeed. And we had such conflicting accounts. So I, I was actually so blown away that I couldn't really even process it last time, which is why I wanted to do quite an in-depth recap this Ooh, time of what okay. happened. Yep. So first of all, when we're talking about Spurius Malius, depending on which account you are following, there are slightly different periods assigned to this. So for me, it was definitely a blend of 440 and 439. Whereas because we're missing Dionysius, we really could only pick up the narrative in the main part of 439 in yours, right? Mm, correct. Yes, exactly. But thanks to your super research skills. We did get that tidbit from Pliny, which seemed to indicate that famine was coming because we had that story about the other dude who lowered the price, who ridiculously <laughs> low, low price. <laughs> yes, we did have a, what is it, a, an aidal of the grain supply, essentially, yes. lower the price right down. And yeah. so we've got this sort of foreshadowing that things are bad yes. on the grain front and the supply front. <laughs> things are bad on the grain front. Yes, exactly. So... What we were dealing with was the fact that there was officially appointed a guy called Nanucius to be the prefect of the grain because he was meant to be the guy solving the grain crisis. So, of course, he didn't take it well when this other guy was showing him up. Even worse, he took it really badly when people shoved him off his magisterial chair and put Malius on instead, being like, this guy knows how to solve the grain problem. He is solving the grain problem. <laughs> You, sir, say you're solving the grain problem, but I'm not. Exactly. But see, that was only in your account. Hence <laughs> my curiosity, Dr. Mm, G, I trying to figure this all out. So first of all, I have seen it said, Dr. G, that the idea of having a prefect of the grain supply might be a little anachronistic at mm. this point in time. Look, that would not surprise me mm. at all. And I think there is... It's, pretty fair to say that mm. what we're seeing with this kind of narrative this early in yes. the Republic is a bit of a, a mix and match of the things that come up 
with grain supply yeah. that really concerned the Romans in the late Republic. Mm. And the parallels with the issue of the Gracchi and what happens there is playing on historians' minds when they write about this early period. And I don't think there's any way to disentangle that kind of mess mm. because the Romans that are writing these analytic histories like Livy and Dionysius of Halicarnassus are very much uh, of the opinion that that Gracchan grain crisis is the way to understand grain supply in Rome. And we're not going to ruin that story for you because uh, you're going to have to tune in to when we get to like 133 BCE uh, to find out what's going on with the Gracchi. It's a date for 10 years' time <laughs> yeah, we'll when we see. finally get to that point. We will see you there. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I would like to say that I did make a bit of a boo-boo last time. I accidentally said, I know, that Manuchius uh, had a history the, the Manukian family, sorry, had a history with Coriolanus, which is partly true, but this specific Manukius has a history with Cincinnatus, which is what I meant oh, to say. okay. Now, the reason why I bring that up again is not just to acknowledge my slight misstep there, but also because we had this appointment of Cincinnatus as dictator and him choosing as his master of the horse. Aha! <laughs> Aha! Aha! Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, the appointment of Cincinnatus as dictator is another thing I think that the scholarship has been like, really? <laughs> is he really? Because, and this is the interesting thing about the, the history of Manuchius, not only does the Manuchian family have a history of dealing with grain issues in the past, going all the way back to the early Republic, but there is this personal history where Manuchius, this Manuchius, got into trouble in 458 BCE militarily and was bailed out by Cincinnatus. Oh, okay. So we're talking some, like, pretty unique connections. Yeah. So is this another parallel where Manuchius has been appointed prefect of the grain supply, isn't doing a great job? In fact, there's obviously a pretty serious problem going on if your account is correct and he's actually been kicked out of office <laughs> by just a random group of people. I mean, I hope it's true. On the plebs. <laughs> yes, exactly. And in that case, is Cincinnatus coming to his rescue once again? Da, 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 da. I know. So there's some weird parallels in the story there. So I'm just going to highlight that. But now let's talk about Malleus again, Dr. G. Oh, let's. Yeah. So we did mention last episode that he does seem to be one of these people that I feel like the patricians in particular have a problem with. Now, the question is, of course, is he even real? <laughs> <laughs> do they have imaginary problems? <laughs> I think the Romans do have imaginary problems a lot of the time. But the fact that there is this blending in my account, and probably in yours if we had it, <laughs> between 440 and 439, that actually is kind of breaking with analytic tradition a bit, isn't it? Because we talked about how the fact that they like to have everything sort of neatly tied up in one year. But the way that this is kind of messily spread from 440 and really into, like if you're talking about the aftermath, into 438, that maybe lends some support for it being a real person and not just someone who is created to, you know, make a point or something like that. I think this also fits into the broader issues that we're facing with our narratives right yeah. now, which we've just entered into this period where you can not only have consuls, but you can also have military tribunes with consular power. Yeah. And what we're going to see for this, and this is a bit of foreshadowing, mm. is probably about a 50-year stretch of things being quite confusing mm. politically and narratively and being able to confine events to a single year, as analysts would like to do, yeah. it's going to be a bit tricky because some of this is not going to be easily tied up. It's no. going to spill over. People aren't going to be sure what's going on and they don't know where they stand. And we're going to see a lot of dictators, just saying. <laughs> Excellent. Well, see, this is the interesting thing. I mean, so we have Cincinnati's being mentioned. Is that a legitimate connection? That probably seems like the shadiest part to me because, as has been highlighted again in the academia, he doesn't really do much. No. I mean... Is there a marriage that we don't know about? It's weird. Like, previously when we've seen Cincinnatus in action, he does actually 
take center stage. Now I know he's an old man. He's 80 point. something at this point. Maybe, yeah. you know, he's like, I'm retiring guys. This is my last swan song. Exactly. Like I know that he would be older and I know that he's not necessarily the focal character. I mean, he's definitely not the focal character here. They're trying to explain other things, but it just does seem a little off <laughs> that he'd be involved and yet not involved, you know? Mm. I don't know. It's a bit weird there. But you do have sources other than Livy and Dionysius mentioning him. So Cicero also mentions that Cincinnatus was made dictator to deal with Spurius Melius specifically. Yeah. I, I don't know that, yeah, I don't yeah. have huge doubts necessarily that mm. Cincinnatus is doing some stuff. Yeah. Now, whether it's this old guy, Cincinnatus, mm. classic Cincinnatus, or whether actually they might be misattributing something that should be going to his son, Ooh. I think that's maybe a question that could be a little bit open because we do see his son enter into politics quite soon after this point in the narrative as well. Yeah, definitely. And then we've also got, as we know, we've got a lot of quintii on the scene. Mm. <laughs> we have... Capitolinus, again, being a consul of this year, so potentially it's also that family connection. So maybe Cincinnatus was around, mm. but it's hard to say. But certainly there do seem to be points to this story in terms of what our sources are trying to achieve. And some of them are what might seem like fairly minor points, I suppose, like explaining how the name Ahala came to be. <laughs> 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 exactly, which you explained really well last time, which had to do with like the armpit, mm. which is, sounds so disgusting. I don't know why you would want that as your name. It's where you hide your dagger before you go into the forum, obviously. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it's also trying to explain something that's going to happen later in our account, so the erecting of a particular monument, I think. Oh, hello. Yes, exactly. So I think it's going to explain that. It might also be trying to explain, so in your account, you mentioned, I think, that some of the treacherous peoples that were associated with Spurius Malius had their heads cut off and displayed. Mm, awkward. Yes. That became a practice. So there was this pool in the forum, apparently. Where, oh, great. <laughs> yeah. I know. What? A pool in the forum. It's a reflective for, pool. For heads. Yes, where you can reflect on your treachery oh, for great. all eternity. <laughs> mm. Yes. So apparently there was this pool in the forum called the Lacus Servilius, which is where the heads of traitors would be displayed. I see. I see. I was actually surprised about that because I don't know that I've ever actually heard mention of this. Yeah, I'd like Roman. to see more of that. Indeed. Yeah, we don't get enough of the reflective pool of treachery <laughs> in later Roman history. The reflective pool of treachery. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I had to have a moment. But then there is another thing that we should perhaps mention here as well. Oh, which goodness. Is, yeah, which is the weird kind of parallel you can see between the story of Ahala and another Republican hero, mm. one Scavola. Oh. oh, well, we're, I haven't done any research on Scavola. I feel like we're a long way that, from him. That is okay. <laughs> but so Scavola is someone we mentioned a long, long time ago. So he was basically given senatorial approval to assassinate someone who was being Annoying for Rome, and that would be one poor Senna. Okay. Oh, that was yeah. a long time ago. A long time ago. And part of his story was explaining the origins of his name. So, Scavola mm. meaning left handed, because part of his whole shenanigans, you know, he put his left hand into the fire and was like, ah! you know, as a test of, yeah. Sinister, that's what I'd call yeah. that. <laughs> so, there is some interesting parallels here, especially with your account, not so much mine, but if things went down as they apparently did in Dionysius, there are some interesting parallels there because in your account, Ahala does seem to have been given like senatorial sanction to go and assassinate Malleus, who is seen as being a troublemaker for the state. It's a huge problem. And mm. we see a return a sort of again and again in some mm. of the later source material mm. that what happens to Ahala in the wake of this assassination mm. is unfortunate and unfair mm. because the thing he was doing was saving the Republic essentially. And even if it was illegal, surely if it's to save the Republic, it's okay. Yes. Yes, exactly. But he gets exiled. 
Well, yes, but as you said, like, was that because he was the fall guy and he knew that... Yeah, but Cicero comes back to this time and time again. There's yeah. lots of mentions in Cicero's speeches in various different places in his corpus where he's kind of like, yeah, but you remember what happened to that guy and he got exiled and that's not fair. Mm, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, just wanted to highlight all of that kind of stuff in there because there certainly have been, as they usually are for this period that we're dealing with, there are always questions raised, I think, in the academia about how real some of this is or is it something that the Romans have constructed over time to tell certain narratives about themselves and their past and that sort of thing. And I, Yeah, and I think mm. it's a good point to make and I'd probably come down on the side of Cornell on this mm. and reading some of his work recently where he's talking about the way in which these stories are so distinctive mm. and there are really particular sort of etymologies drawn out of them. It's like the chances of them being completely fabricated mm. seem slim. Yes. Now, how mixed up the details might be in the retelling and, mm. and the way that which people assert their own kind of interests and reference points into how they retell those tales yes. is another thing that we can really think about. But the idea that this is just completely made up Roman history yeah. it seems pretty unlikely. Absolutely. Some stuff is happening and we're in this period which seems to be politically very unstable. Yes. I think that's the thing. I think that the more I look at this, I can say, okay, yes, you can see that there are some slightly mythical or folklorish aspects to this. And maybe, maybe certain aspects have been slightly exaggerated to form some really interesting parallels that the Romans themselves might be drawing between, you know, early events and then this thing that's happening. But I agree. I actually do lean on the side of most of these elements being based on something real. The interesting thing is just those different traditions because we had such different accounts of how it all went down. I mean, yes, in the end, Spurius Melius was killed. The, the important details are the same. Yeah. But the man is dead Yeah, and Rome is swimming in grain. <laughs> but, yeah, yours was so much more sinister than mine. Uh, yeah. Mine yeah. was just a guy, I mean, you know, it was a kind of story that you might hear in certain countries these days. Where I'm just wondering if somebody's destroyed Dionysius of Halicarnassus' script on purpose because they don't, they can't handle the truth. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly can. <laughs> but anyway, so I just sort of highlight that as we're going through because after, you know, thinking about how different our accounts were and, and how yours just seems so much more sinister and yet also, as you said, I was really taken in <laughs> by the vision of this senatorial conspiracy. Mm. And I feel like Spurious Manly is going to raw deal, man. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's my recap for... 440 and 439. <laughs> and with that, let us move into the next year in Rome's analytic history. Mm. 438. It's 438 BCE. <laughs> uh, what I can tell you is that Dionysus of Halicarnassus is missing for this year. Get out of town. Mm. It's really sad how often that's happening now. Uh, yeah, it's going to happen more than more. Yeah. yeah. He's turning into fragments all around me. <sighs> Very well, then. Well, I shall tell you, then, what I have in my <laughs> particular account. So it actually kind of goes straight into the aftermath for me in 438 in Livy. So before I go into that, though, I might just give you a little bit of detail about who we've got ruling Rome at this Ooh, point. Yeah, in who's yeah. in charge? Yeah. So we have military tribunes with consular power this uh, year. Uh, oh, I know. Okay, after a dictator, we need a palate cleanser. <laughs> well, we haven't had many of these since that was a possibility. No. It's been very consul heavy. Yeah. yeah. We had, what, one group and then they got pushed out because the ritual wasn't done properly? I think so. And replaced by consuls. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> that so, had a great track record. I have one uh, Mamercus Aemilius, mm. uh, or maybe Mamercinus. Oh, yes. Uh, Mamercinus. Mamercinus. Yes, indeed. Mamercus Aemilius Mamercinus. Yes, and then as you highlighted, I have one Lucius Quintius Cincinnatus. Ah, uh, yes. So this is the son of the famous Cincinnatus mm. dictator of the previous year. Exactly. Or, or and dictator it? of... <laughs> 458 as well. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> um, and they are both patricians. No one will be shocked to learn. And then there is also perhaps either a Lucius or a Nius, Julius. Julius Ullus. 
Yes, exactly. Another patrician. Yeah. Mm. All right. So they've opened it up to military tribunes <laughs> with consular power and it's just patricians all the way down. Yeah, they kind of <laughs> thought the point was to, you know, mix it up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, but apparently not. Apparently so. no. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Anywho, so what we have got here is that we have got the order going out that the house of Spurius Malius needs to be destroyed. Oh. I mentioned this in the last episode as a bit of a foreshadowing. So the house is going to be destroyed because such was the insanity and the evilness of his plan that they needed to make sure the very existence of the place Oh, okay, no so more. this is like the literal house. He's a literal oh, house. Oh, yeah. not like a plague upon your houses and no, it's the no, family. No, no. Okay. Spurious Malice is actual house because, of course... Lest you forget, Dr. G, he did a lot of his plotting there. Did he hide the grain there as well? It's tainted. It's tainted. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, so, and this is going to become a new site, which, again, is perhaps part of the point of this story to kind of explain why this particular place exists and why it's called the thing that it's called. Okay, right. so it's called the Aquimalium. Ooh. Yes. I think it's a bit of a portmanteau going on there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We're so, getting just over to the equilibrium of things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So apparently this was located in a place called uh, the Vicus Eucarius. Vicus Eucarius. Mm, mm. And where is that in Rome? It's basically <laughs> just below the capital. Okay, so cool. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Spurius Malius was a rich guy. So yeah. I presume his house was in a primo location. <laughs> So, uh, in terms of like, so the capital's a hill and the forum's here. Is it if you ask of... me which direction, yeah. I can't tell. Oh, you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd ask. Yeah. So, Cicero apparently claimed that the origin of the name came from aqueous or just. Okay. Whereas Varro says it's from level. Like, I'm pretty. Right. Yeah, okay. Something like that. Who knows? <laughs> the house is gone. Yes, exactly, yeah. Um, but, yes, it certainly seems to have been along the way that you would take um, to the Roman Forum. And, yeah, so it's, it's yeah, it's in a fairly central okay. location. Yeah, yeah it's a nice spot. And so do they build something else there? They, they are into erecting something else. Okay. <laughs> that sounds dirty. Wow. Well, <laughs> I bet they are. Uh, necessarily dirty. So, so Lucius Manucius, our prefect of the grain, who apparently was useless and yet is still going to be rewarded because he's on the right side of history, Dr. Because he's a patrician and yeah. it always works out for those guys. Yeah. So he is going to be given an ox and a gilded statue. Why? What's he done? Well, he reported Spurious oh, Nelius' treachery. He's a snitch. <laughs> You're very forgetful about these details, <laughs> Dr. G. Uh, I, <laughs> yes. just, I just don't respect. Don't reward snitches. Oh, there you go. So this apparently would stand outside the Porta Trigamina. Mm -hmm. Okay. Trigamina. Trigamina. <laughs> <laughs> Just trips off the tongue. Yeah, it does. Yes. Uh, now, this apparently is an area that is associated with, like, wharves and, you know, trade and that kind of stuff. So I think that, mm -hmm. therefore, there's some sort of link there to, you know, grain. <laughs> that, All right. That kind of stuff. But, yeah. Any hoozy. And so... The plebeians allow this to happen, although you've got to assume that they're not thrilled about this whole situation because Spurius Malius seems to become very popular with them in particular. So I would have thought they'd be grieving pretty hard. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I suppose what I'm, I'd be looking for, and I don't have any source material, so I've got nothing to go with, I'd be like, what happens to Malius's body? After mm. he is assassinated, because he's put yes. on he's put on display, so this you've got this traitor ref, pool of reflection, <laughs> apparently. So, but surely uh, the love of that the plebeians have, mm. or has been held up to have, might suggest that they might try to rescue that corpse and maybe mm. give it a proper burial and things like that. Do Lucretia we, style, or yeah. Like, do we get yeah, any sense? Style. Virginia style. I'm just mixing up all my names lately. <laughs> Too many of them. Yeah. But do they have? Um, any sense of which they, they're trying to, like, look after his legacy or something. Yeah, yeah. Malius's Well, I guess there self. is a memorial where his house used to be. <laughs> Awkward. Yeah, but it just might be not the kind of memorial he might desire. No. Mm. <laughs> anyway, so then Manucius has been able, because of everything that's gone down, to seize all the corn that Malius had managed to procure. 
Oh, I'm not just going to steal the man's life. I'm going to steal his legacy as well. Know. I'm like, this just seems so... So patrician. Yeah, but anyway. And then he can distribute it at a very, very low price. Wow. Like, like more than the low, low that you were talking about before. This is low, low, low. Wow. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I wonder if there might be a conflation with what's going on in those references as well. Well, this is what I was wondering. wondering. Yeah. Back back in the day when you first referred to that guy, I was like, is this a reference to... To this guy? To this guy. <laughs> but certainly it does seem that he was, yeah, distributing it for... A pretty good... Bargain price. basement price. Yeah, exactly. All right. Indeed. Yeah. Now, there's also another detail about the nucleus, which I uh, need to pass your way. Mm-hmm. Yes, get ready for it. So, Livy does acknowledge that there are slightly different accounts of this, and he's using different historians to sort of piece this all together. But it seems that somehow Manuchius is at this point transferred from the patricians to the plebeian class. I was expecting him to react. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how to react to that. Uh, yeah, and this is why. why? On, on what oh, account? Oh, you just wait. You just wait. <laughs> They're making him the 11th tribune of the plebs. Ew. Why? <sighs> why why <laughs> do the patricians need to have a reason mm. to rub it in the face mm. of the Bovians? I don't know it just a uh, I don't feel like a where's the sense making here <laughs> yeah it does seem to be an odd one but I think it was because they wanted a, a mom you know they wanted to make sure that the tribunes weren't thinking any thoughts mm. that they didn't like that might you know lead to the pool of treachery <laughs> mm. so i think they wanted him in there to steer the ship in the right course right okay but to be honest if you're going to do that there are probably <laughs> less obvious people to do the job yeah but and also he snitched once why wouldn't he snitch again? everybody knows what he is i know right, I mean, like who's gonna tell him anything a meeting at the tribune of the plebs where there's now 11 of them they're like well i guess we'll well, this crack is delicious i'm loving this grain you know <laughs> wait till he goes to the bathroom we're like quick plan the overthrow of the government <laughs> i know it does seem like a really odd part to this story yeah mm. the vibes are off they really are, but yet this is, this is what I've got to work with. Livy, I mean, what are you doing? Well, he does say, you know, different accounts. He does acknowledge there's something. There's some discrepancies here. here you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, all of this seems like a real, you know, wound meets salt <laughs> to the plebeians yeah. who've just lost their hero. Because no, I should have mentioned actually. Not only was he given the statue, but like that was paid for at the public expense. I mean, yeah. I, I presumed you would guess that, but... <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> that makes total sense. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it does seem like Ooh. a lot of weirdness going on here in the aftermath, which, again, actually lends credibility, I think, to this story. I mean, and obviously, beyond the written sources that we're using here, all these physical locations that we're talking about these physical markers, memorials and spaces within the city or near the city or whatever, it all suggests that our historians would have been able to verify that these things existed, obviously. Yeah. That there's there's potentially these are things that are still there or still remembered as having been there. Yeah, Yeah. I think if we're talking about archaeological sites, yes, yes, there's Mm -hmm. often going to be like a legacy of remembrance in places, which would allow these stories to be recounted. And it's a matter of then for people like Livy and Dionysius of how they make those places make sense in accordance with the sorts of stories that they're hearing from elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, Livy does note, Dr. G, that he doesn't think the patricians would let the number of tribunes of the plebs actually get higher. So turning it up to 11. <laughs> yeah, you're setting a dangerous precedent. Yeah, he notes that this also seems a little weird. He also is like, why would you make 11 even if one of them you know, was on your side? Why would the patricians have any interest in introducing this? Because they hate it. <laughs> You know, why would they, you add things into the thing that you dislike? Yeah. Mm. Why would you make its power potentially greater? Mm. Okay. And and presumably, once you've set a precedent, because, you know, the Romans are very big on precedent, once you've set the precedent of having 11 tribunes of the plebs, surely the plebs are going to want to keep it at lucky number 11 <laughs> and not go back to 10. So 
And also, having 11 would mean that there would never be a tie in the vote on anything. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a good number. That's true, I suppose. But anyway, he basically says that he can't really be sure about why the weirdness of the details. <laughs> but he does mention that he is basing this on an inscription that he's referring to. Ooh. I would presume he's referring to the inscription that would probably have accompanied the statue of Lucius Minucius. Well, maybe, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Absolutely. So, All right. yeah. Yeah, I don't know really what to make of any of that. No, well, especially because if you consider what we've dealt with before, so when they reintroduced Tribunes of the Plebs after the whole December thing, there was that issue as well of them not voting in 10 Tribunes and people being able to choose colleagues, like being like, I'm going to buddy up with that guy and he can be a Tribune along with me who was elected. We had that whole story as well. And then... That was decided as a bad idea. So, yeah, this whole thing really doesn't seem to add up because we had the passage of the law, the Lex Trebonia, only a few years ago, which said you had to keep voting until you get the number that you need, which is 10 at yeah, this point in time. It seems very odd that anything but, like, a legal precedent would be able to increase the number to 11. Yes, unless, and then this is where the haziness of it all comes in. You and I have often said that sometimes we can't be sure of the numbers that we're given for these particular offices, you know, that there were this many and that it was this strict at this point in time. Yeah, yeah. And there's a sense in which, mm. like, in the same way that we seem to be navigating, like, how do we rule with a top magistrate group? Is it going to be consuls? Is it yeah. going to be military tribunes with consular power? We're having the same sort of issues with the Tribune of the Plebs. And it's yeah. like, do they pick a buddy? Do we continue to vote until they get them all in? Are we able to just chuck a patrician in there by saying they're a plebeian now? Yeah. You know, they're trying to figure some stuff out here. And I think this is all evidence of the sort of crisis mode that I think Rome is in at the moment where yeah. they're not sure how to do stuff. No. They haven't landed on their feet after the 2nd December it has wrapped up. Yeah. And they're still really concerned. And on top of that, it's a famine. And yeah. so people have, are not in their right minds. People are desperate and maybe people are making decisions that they wouldn't normally make yeah. under better conditions. Absolutely. And, of course, as you might expect – there is some resistance from the tribunes of the plebs. They're not just like, no, no, here, my old buddy, my old pal. Come on in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so apparently the guys who resisted are Quintius Caecilius, Quintius Unius, and Sextus Titanius. Mm. Yeah, so these guys are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Hold up. Don't so know if Manukius should three be Three out of the ten are like, they bring uh, them. <laughs> yeah. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't think Manukis should be getting any of these honours. I mean, are we forgetting the fact that he is surely partially responsible, along with Ahala, for the murder of Spurius Malius? Hello? I mean, you might not <laughs> like the guy, but he brought a lot of food in. Exactly, yeah. So this is why we end up getting in 438, because this is actually kind of the tail end of 439 for me. This is why in 438 we end up getting military tribunes with consular power because these guys force through an action to make sure that that's what's going to happen. Mm -mm. And yet, as I mentioned, they're all patrician. They're all patrician. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah, it's what tough out there. On? Yeah. This period of Roman history is bonkers. <laughs> I know. I think that they were obviously assuming that the plebeians would be able to get elected as a military tribune because if they uh, campaigned on the platform that they were going to seek justice for Malius, that that would presumably be enough to get them into power. Apparently not. Mm. It's all so <laughs> weird. I know. I know it's all So weird. many questions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But this is why we get uh, Amelius Mamercus, mm. very early guy, and this is why we get Lucius Julius. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of future fame right. in terms of family name, etc. Yes, yes. Pay and attention course, to these people. Yeah, Lucius Quintus, who we've talked about as being the son of Cincinnati. So, and this is the thing. These guys aren't just patricians. These guys are apparently super elite patricians. Yeah, yeah. These are very prominent families <laughs> yes. at this point. Yeah. So that's very interesting. And it's like, let's just throw all of the big 
big gun patricians into the uh, military tribune. And this is where maybe it does actually all make sense. After the patricians perhaps being really shaken by what happened with Spurius Malleus, they're not taking any chances mm. that they're going to have their top guys on the scene. <laughs> but how they would make sure that happens presumably would have to be, you know, using clients, I guess, and that kind of thing. I don't really know how they would make sure that happens, but... And yet they do. And yet, yeah. 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 438. So I don't have a lot of detail about this yet. It's okay. pretty fair. Yes. Um, I have Dinodora Siculus, mm-hmm. who lets us know that we've got some military tribunes rather than consuls. Excellent. Fair enough. We agree. Yeah, <laughs> he's all over that. But he also then is super interested in the Peloponnesian War. Mm. And... <laughs> okay. The Pel- well, I mean, <laughs> we'll pause right there because yeah. it's 438. Yes. BC in Rome. Sure. And when does the Peloponnesian War start? I actually can't remember. 431. Right. Okay. Uh, so we've got already um, Diodorus Siculus is giving us a bit of a hint that we've got some analytic potential issues going on here. Right. Where the fasties don't necessarily match up to what's happening elsewhere or maybe he's incorrect about when he thinks the Peloponnesian War starts. But right. there is a sense in which we're slipping through some of the years mm. and we're maybe not able to hold on to the details as much as we can and neither can the historians. What are you talking about? <laughs> Everything we've said so far has been so straightforward. It makes so much sense. <laughs> well, it's going to it's gonna keep slipping like this, at least yes. in my material, mm. for quite a few years. Right. So yeah. I'm flagging it now that, like, <laughs> even Diodorus is kind of like, well, this is the year that, you know, <laughs> Euthodemos was the Archon in Athens. So he tells you who the Archon is, and right. they usually rule for, like, anywhere between, like, a two- and four-year period. And then he gives you the consuls. So you're like, okay, cool. And then he's like, and now on to the Peloponnesian War. And you're right, like, okay. wait a second. Yeah. And he's super interested in the Peloponnesian War. So he's like, he's I'm going to give you all the details on that because that is incredible, guys. Screw what's happening in Rome. Yeah, Rome's not yeah. that much, not that interesting to me. Yeah. But the other thing that we get, and this is where I start relying on Broughton a lot, I'm like, who's even who in Rome at this point in time? Yes. And he tells us there's a whole bunch of ambassadors. Yeah, so they're going to come up in the next part mm. of what I have to say. Yes. whole bunch of ambassadors. And so we've got Gaius Fulcinius, Clolius Tullus, mm-hmm. Spurius Antius, and Lucius Roscius. Mm. Uh, some of them are named. And we also have mention of the Etruscan king, mm. Lars Tolumnius. He's going to be a big part of my next couple of years. Don't you? Yeah. He's a, <laughs> we've got the, the king of the Etruscans. So the way that Etruscan kingship works, as mm. far as we can tell, yes. is that they have... They divide it up. They've got 12 kings, essentially. Wow. <laughs> well, that's because they've got so many different regions. They've got right? different regions. Yeah. And so they've got kings of regions. Yes. And then they sort of, within themselves, someone might be the king of kings. But... <laughs> wow. Well, it's sounding very Games of Thrones-ish. I love a king of kings. <laughs> it's hard to know um, when you encounter an Etruscan king whether you've encountered a king or the king. Mm. So... We are the kings of different regions. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Lars Tolumius, mm. uh, Etruscan king. Um, and that's kind of... I don't get any details about what happens to any of these characters. Oh, just you wait. You're in for a treat. <laughs> this is uh, quite the conundrum. But I do have Lars Tolumnius, uh, Tolumnius mm. does last, does live into the next year, just just in case okay. that might affect your narrative. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get back to Livy, shall we? <laughs> All right, so we have this whole thing. Where we've got the military tribunes with consular power. Okay? Mm. They're in, they're very elite. <laughs> Scene change. <laughs> We're no longer concerned about what is or isn't happening within Rome itself, the messy power dynamics between the patricians and the plebeians, etc. Okay? Instead, we are switching to the Roman colony of Fidine. Ah, Fidine. Yes. Mm. Now, Fidine is somewhat close to the city of Ve, and I think we have mentioned both of them quite a bit in previous yeah. episodes where we've been talking about conflict with the Etruscans and that sort of thing. Yeah, so Ve is the Etruscan city just to the north of Rome, yeah. and Fidine is kind of just a bit to the east and south. It's They're co-located, as it were. <laughs> yes, indeed, yes. 
Now, what basically happens is this Roman colony of Fidine revolts and transfers its allegiance to Vey. Ooh. Yes. Which is ruled by one... Lars Tolumius! Yes, exactly. <laughs> and that's where he comes into my account, okay? Mm. So, this is an interesting development. They've defected. Have. They have defected, wow. okay? It's, it's not going to go well for them, I'll tell you that. <laughs> anyway, but this was made even worse, okay, by this particular situation, okay? Which is... The Romans sent some ambassadors to ask, why the switch? Uh, to Fidine. Yes, to Fidine. Oh, guys, yes. you're ours. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, but your roots are either, you're either like Alvin or Latin or something, but you ain't Etruscan, and you were loyal to us, so why are you switching brands? Maybe ask why you've chosen to switch to a different insurance policy. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to consider your answer? Exactly. Mm. Now, these ambassadors are put to death. By the Fidinos? Yeah. Oh. This is their response. Wow. Yeah. They're in with the Etruscans. They're like yeah, that. Exactly. And this is where I get the names as well. So we've got, as you said, Gaius Fulcinius. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. <laughs> Gaius Fulcinius. Cloelius Tullus, Spurius Antius, and Luscius Roscius. Yeah. Now, that's another name I can get on board with. <laughs> Luscius Roscius. <Ooh>. You rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, some people try and say that this was a poor choice of the Etruscan king who was now obviously in charge of affairs because, you know, of the defection. Obviously, he's behind it. Well, yeah, you would presume he's so. He's encouraged yeah. this sort of behaviour. Exactly, yeah. So, King Tolumnius. What's the deal? Okay. Lars, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, it's a bit of a Henry II and Thomas Beckett situation. Look up 1170 in English history. So there is this story that Henry II said something like, you know, who's going to rid me of this troublesome priest? And this was overheard by some knights who then went and killed Thomas Beckett, right? <laughs> Disaster. So, yeah. Not good. Most famously parried in Blackadder, which I'm not going to lie, is where I'm getting most of my information from. <laughs> I didn't really bother to look it up. I just knew the story. <laughs> Excellent research skills. <laughs> Anywho, um, but this situation reminds me a little bit of that because apparently it might have been a mistake because Lars Tolumnius was playing with dice and he said something whilst he was playing with his dice, which was overheard by some people from Fidene who thought he was giving some sort of order about killing the ambassadors. Oh, well, that's awkward. Yeah, so he might have just been playing Monopoly. Oh. Yeah. Something like, I hate Romans. <laughs> something like that, yeah, exactly. So I can't afford to buy the capital. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something along those lines, where he said something while he was playing a game or, or he was unclear about maybe, you know, where he was directing his speech. Maybe he was playing whilst he was talking to some people from Fidene and he was actually talking about the game, but they thought he was talking to them. I don't know. But anyway, mm. Livy doesn't buy it. <laughs> He's like, like an excuse the king. It's a cover story at yeah. the very best. This it's... guy is aiming at revolt across the board. He yeah. wants war with Rome. Well, and this is the other thing, and this would be very clever if it was true, and part of me thinks it is actually just that clever to be true. <laughs> Apparently, Livy thinks that he was maybe deliberately a bit unclear or something in the way that he gave these orders because he wanted the people of Fidene to be complicit in the mm. act. He didn't want it to just be something that all oh, the Etruscans did. Yeah. He wanted it to be something where the people of Fidene were yeah, committed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they killed Roman envoys. They're in. Yeah. They're all in now. <laughs> There's no going back. And so that might be why he deliberately yeah. orchestrated this situation. I wonder if this is part of the broader issues that are going on at the moment, because it's mm. not like the famine is instantly over. No. No, um, exactly. And so I imagine there's quite a lot of desperation in a lot of regions. Mm. And maybe Fidine has decided to switch so they can source a grain supply for themselves. Well, look, geography is not my strong point, but Fidine is of, I mean, all these places are fairly close to each other if we consider how big Rome is going to become. But Fidine is quite close today. It like, is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it wouldn't be crazy. It's not like they're throwing going, you know what? 
we're going to throw that lot with China. <laughs> we just heard about it. <laughs> yeah, Saturday. no, they're, they're throwing yeah. it in with a really close neighbour and yeah. potentially Rome has had its own problems for quite mm. some time, it would appear, yeah. at least from the histories that we've been looking at. And so maybe they need some stuff that they just can't get any other way and it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, those ambassadors, well, they just have to go. Well, and this is the thing. Because they died nobly in the line of duty, they also get statues at the public expense. Oh, what? Are, but there's a lot of statues going on now. They really are. I don't, <laughs> I don't remember time. I don't, I don't think this is... No, this doesn't seem the right time for a lot of statues. If I was naming this like a Friends episode, I would call this the one with five statues. Oh, that's a lot of statues. It is, mm. yeah, absolutely. So um, they get the statues erected uh, on the rostra. Now, this place is the speaker's platform in the forum but apparently it wouldn't actually be officially called the rostra until like a hundred years from now <laughs> so i'm guessing that that's just a description so that people of his own time would roughly know where <laughs> these statues were located but anyway. the speaker's own yeah and that's probably why we actually have such a great collection of their names because their names probably would have been obviously inscribed on said statues. I see. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So that is really where 438 wraps up for me with a situation where clearly the Romans are like, well, I'll tell you what, it's war. <laughs> it's war with the Etruscans. Oh, it's a cliffhanger. It is. Yeah. What yeah. will happen next? Will Rome avenge its murdered ambassadors? Mm, I think they will. <laughs> 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 but yes, but this is basically where 438 wraps up with uh, with the Romans being like, well, it's very clearly war because, you know, there's not really any other way to take the murder of your ambassadors. No, no. no thanks a lot for dating. I mean, and really also, I mean, it would really be the equivalent of murdering a customer service person who asked why you're switching electricity to rice. <laughs> I mean, you know, they were just asking. They were, as far as I'm aware, they didn't, you know, they didn't do anything. Was, no, but they didn't. They just, they just went over to be like, hey, what's the deal? Hey, buddy. Where's the beef? <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. Are we not providing an adequate electricity supply? <laughs> Can you please provide us with specific feedback so that we may improve the Roman experience for On a scale families? of one to ten, how would you rate our services? <laughs> and can you please explain why? <laughs> mm. yeah. Anyway, so, yeah. That's, All where right. that's where I'm going to wrap up. Oh, look, I, I think that's probably a good place for us to wrap up the episode as Excellent. well. All right. That means, Dr. G, that it is time for the partial pick. <laughs> a shout out um, to uh, our Patreon supporter, Robin, who has inquired <laughs> most uh, sympathetically on behalf of Igor and what has happened to yeah. him. <laughs> Igor, Igor will return to the podcast version, but... Just not the video because we have to edit Igor in. So, yeah. Poor Igor. Poor Igor. Yeah. <laughs> it is time for the partial pick, which means there are 50 golden eagles mm. up for grabs for the Romans in five different categories. Yeah. Mm. Let's see how they do this year. <laughs> All right. So, what is our first category, Dr. G? Military clout. Huh. Well, I mean, I guess there is kind of some action, but it doesn't go well for the Romans. I mean, does having military tribunes instead of consuls automatically give you clout, militarily-wise? Mm, no, I don't think uh, so. I thought I'd try. It's a zero, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Diplomacy! Look, the Romans really tried. They did, They actually. sent some ambassadors. Do we... I think we could, we can give them points for trying to be diplomatic, <laughs> even if it wasn't received very diplomatically. Oh, I think so, yeah. It's a nice gesture. They didn't just turn up with an army. They were like, quick, send yeah. the ambassadors. Yeah, okay. So maybe we give them what? Five? Yeah. Okay, five. Because <laughs> we don't really know how threatening the ambassadors were being. I mean, did they ask for it? Mm. Were they being kind of douchey? I, I don't want to, I don't want a victim blame. I don't want to either, but I mean, it is the Romans. They might have been being a bit douchey about it. That's true. Yeah. It's hard to know. All right, so five. Expansion. Definitely not. They've lost territory. <laughs> Can we, can we minus points? I think that's a minus one right there. Yeah. Lost Bedino. So what, are we down to four then? All right, four it is. Uh, Weirtus. Okay. Hmm. Mm. Not really. I mean, dying in the line of beauty, I mean, it gets you a statue, but... Look, I think we can say that as far as the patricians are concerned... Sure. Manucius... Yes. Ha him. He's deserved that statue as far as they're 
Well, he said we his... might disagree with that, but yeah. he's been given a statue. Well, it's like when Livy first introduced him, he basically said, look, he wasn't a great prefect of the grain, but he was great for liberty. Mm. <laughs> so clearly his reputation is one of preserving something that the Romans value very highly, or at least certain Romans. So it's, I think it's liberty for some. Ooh. Maybe not. Yes. Yeah. All right, so yeah. I think there has to be a weird twist score here. Yeah, definitely. Um, so <sighs> is there anything greater than receiving a statue? Maybe getting a wreath of some kind. Um, but getting a statue is pretty up there, so I feel like it has to be probably about a six or a seven. Okay, yeah. I'll give him a six just because I don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. And what is it like to be a citizen at Ooh. this time? The citizen score. Is it a good time to be a citizen in I Rome? Don't think so. I mean, you've got some more grain now, so that's... I mean, it's up from before, but... Uh... Yeah, look, it does seem like the famine would be must be easy. I mean, even with murdered ambassadors, I don't know that the Romans could afford to commit to a war if the famine was really at its lowest point. It, yeah. might, it might have all wrapped up, but I think they'd need to mm. be fairly certain that, you know, things at home are going to be fairly stable. Mm. Yeah, so, okay, yes, got some grain. And, and, and that's what Manukis apparently did, right? Killed Malius and then took all the glory by distributing <laughs> distributing the grain. The grain. Oh, yeah. Like hmm. Yeah. So there's that aspect of it, but then on the other hand, they also have to deal with the fact that the tribune of the plebs has now been infiltrated by a patrician. Yes. Who's been turned into a plebeian? But everybody knows what that means. Yes. This is true. And this is what I mean. I feel like it's not good, not good. <laughs> because we also have all patricians being military tribunes with consular power. Yes. And very, very, very prestigious people too. Mm. And then you've got that Cincinnatus connection. Because even if he wasn't the dictator in 439, now his douchebag son is there too. <laughs> yeah. So I, he's made a comeback. The I feel like I can really only give it a one, Dr. G, just because you're not starving to death. <gasps> all right. I was going to say two at most, so I'm happy with well, one. Well, I mean, let's face it, now we've also got a war coming through, mm. which means who's going to be serving? It's time to get co-opted, my friends. Yeah. So if you add that up as well, yeah, I think mm. definitely a one. All right. All right. So that means that because we've introduced for the first time <laughs> a minus a score, score <laughs> that the Romans end up on 11 golden eagles. <laughs> Probably could have been 12, but we're feeling extra mean today. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Rome. Next time, next time. Yeah. A chance for greater glory, perhaps. Indeed. <laughs> a pleasure speaking to you, as always. As always, Dr. G. I just realised I'm waving at the camera like it's actually stopped because you're pressing stop. <laughs> no, 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 the, the, camera, the camera's still going. going. <laughs> still going, still going. <laughs> and... Do you want me to lean over and... I don't know, you can, yeah, turn that thing off.